Good morning and welcome to the 1619, the first Friday meeting of the month of June. Uh, welcome to the group. We're looking forward to a great presentation today from Linda Pope, our special guest speaker. And uh, this is the pre-meeting initiation of the meeting. We will pause this recording here and then restart when the meeting actually begins. So we look forward, thank you for coming. We look forward to your participation and enjoyment of, our, of this presentation. Well, welcome everyone. Here we go. Linda Pope is our guest speaker. She's in here from Houston today. So she's probably experiencing a little bit different weather, but uh, I've written up an introduction to who Linda is and it's up on the website. So I won't use up any of the meeting time with this. I'll just turn it over to Linda and have Linda go ahead with her presentation, which I'm really looking forward to. So Linda, it, the floor is yours and we'll take questions at the, at the end. Well, first of all, it's a, it's a privilege. Um, this is only occurring because um, Dick was the uh, impetus to ask me to write something. And over the course of doing this for the past month or so, I've discovered many things about myself. Um, and last night with my son had discussions about self-realization and what happens when you review your history and you do a little research that, and discover things you didn't know. So there are some things that I'm going to talk about I have to read because there are things I didn't even know about my dad and some, some places that I've lived. Um, I titled this, Am I My Father's Dream Come True? Uh, the tagline is, are we there yet? <laughs> the Negro Leagues gave Dave Pope, my dad, a shot at the majors. Baseball was not his dream, it was his passion. He was an outfielder. Between the history behind this is between 1525 and 1866, 12.5 million people were kidnapped from Africa and sent to the Americas through the transatlantic slave trade. Only 10.7 million survived the journey. Following emancipation, Blacks saw opportunities in the outside of the South and the Great Migration began, which ended in 1970 with about 47% of Black people calling the North and the West home. My parents' families were among those seeking better lives when they left Alabama in the mid-1900s, ultimately settling in the hills of Pennsylvania. My 1980, May 1980, the night of graduation from medical school, my dad, my mom told me a secret about my dad. I was my dad's dream come true. Then she explained the secret he held. After graduating from Library High School in 1939, dad had been accepted into University of Pittsburgh as pre-med and played baseball there for three years. That's something I didn't know. Finishing college and med school were deferred because he uh, enlisted in the army in uh, World War II and, and was, uh, had spent a year of service there and then was discharged. He never returned to Pitt. Dream detoured. Dad began his baseball career in 1946, playing in the Negro Leagues, first with the Homestead Grays, along with his brother, Willie Pope, and later with the Pittsburgh Crawfords. I remember dad's stories about traveling the South as a Negro and how challenging it was. No matter, he and the likes of Cool Papa Bell, Josh Gibson and Sacho Page loved the game. They endured what they had to in order to play a game they loved. They depended on the green book to navigate the Southern states and places they could stay. My parents married in October, 1947, before church service in the pastor's parlor. There's a story about the blue taffeta dress that my mother wore that she saved for me, but she was a size four. I could never wear it. <laughs> Their union would produce a family of four children. She had, they had three daughters and one son. In 1948, dad signed on with the Farnham of the Quebec Provincial League an independent semi-pro league at the time where he played along with my uncle Willie, 
And this league, it turns out, I found out was a league for the dispossessed players at that time. I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at McGee Hospital in 1949, a preemie about the size of a Coca-Cola bottle. The women in my family knew how to fatten up a kid and by six months of age, mom had taken me to Quebec where we joined my dad. It was there that my father told her, Linda will be the doctor. He's, he was signed in 1950 as a free agent by the Cleveland Indians farm team. Interestingly, it was there that he would learn more about segregation and racial differences. Having grown up, my dad, having grown up in an integrated town in Pennsylvania and having played two seasons in an integrated Canadian league and organized baseball was to kind of cause him to get adjusted to something a little bit different. I found a quote from a reporter my dad joined the Cleveland Indians and during spring training, he and seven other black ball players had to stay in what was a tool shed. It was 30 feet by 30 feet. The white players could stay elsewhere. My dad never really called it racism. He called it somewhat disadvantaged separation. And they termed where the white players lived, the wigwam, and where the black players live, the teepee. While segregation was an unfortunate part of life off the field, my dad never experienced any of it on the field. All they wanted to do was play ball and win. We traveled internationally, east and west coast of the United States. Cleveland Indians, 1952, 1954 to 55, 1956. Baltimore, Maryland, the Orioles, 1956, 1955 to 56, San Diego, 57, 58, off to Puerto Rico and Venezuela, sometimes in Canada and Toronto, and ultimately in Houston, Texas with the Houston Buffs. We'll talk a little bit more about the Buffs in detail. My ebony skinned, almost coal black father was considered the spiritual leader on each team. I believe it was his faith and belief in the goodness of all men that helped him endure and not mention many instances of mistreatment because of his race. He raised my siblings and I to see all people as created in God's image and therefore of value. The dream incubator was family and community, 1949-1955. Library, Pennsylvania, was an unincorporated community in South Park Township, Pennsylvania. Originally, it was called Loafers Hollow, I found out. And I also found out that it was actually planted by a coal mining company. And that's why each house looked the same. I didn't know that when I was a kid. It was the Champion Coal Company that uh, serviced the coal burning furnaces in every home there. My parents happened to live on each end of the same street. So they grew up as uh, sweethearts. Adults had authority in library and were to be respected. God was supreme ruler to whom any wayward soul would be brought for reproof and correction. In retrospect, Library Pennsylvania was like a little hamlet in a fairy tale. Racism didn't seem to exist there. Uh, the men worked together in the coal mines. and Everybody had the same intent of making a living. However, cousins I had who lived in Alabama and worked, uh, some of them worked in the county morgues, would send word up north about the lynchings, tarrings, featherings, cross burnings, and the Klan. I remember seeing black and white photos of burned and mutilated bodies sent up north for the older folks to see. We were incubated, waiting to hatch our own dreams. I briefly attended kindergarten and library and had a good time. My teacher was a white lady and a lot of my classmates were white kids. We didn't see any differences. As I grew older, summers in library of Pennsylvania were fairly common and I always treasured riding the streetcar with my grandmother into town. 
Randy would always tell me, Negroes always had to look their best and stay behaved. Library of Pennsylvania was the dream incubator providing me safe boundaries, discipline, respect for elders, and loving family and community. Hmm. Dream insulator, the 1954 World Series and years beyond my elementary school years. I, I had to do a little research with this. In 1955, there were at least four events that shaped or did some shape changing in the United States. May 1955, Supreme Court rules desegregation of schools must occur. August 1955, the Georgia Board of Education fired all black teacher, teachers who were members of the NAACP. August 1955, Emmett Till was murdered in Money, Mississippi. November 7th, 1955, the U.S. Supreme Court banned segregation in public parks and in playgrounds. The 54 World Series brought palpable excitement and celebration to Cleveland, even for a little girl. Parades, celebrations, newsmen, cameras, autograph seekers, player interviews and parties were all part of the scene. Never thought my dad was a celebrity though. Baseball for him and for us was his job. Our community, part of the Emerald Necklace, was a protected environment with black lawyers, accountants, dentists, doctors, educators, and small business owners as neighbors. The Cleveland Library became my refuge where I would read extensively about black people. I would read National Geographic Magazine, Ebony, and Jet Magazines the Encyclopedia of Britannica that my dad bought for our household. And I'd imagine places I could go and things I could be. We enjoyed local black owned restaurants, dry cleaners, hardware store, nightclubs, bakeries, and churches, too many to count. I remember Mr. Sid, a generous Jewish man who owned what I thought was a huge department store in our community. My dad bought my first bike there. Our elementary school teachers at Miles Standish were fantastic black and white educators. Most memorably was Mrs. Clark, who instilled strict discipline with a tap on your knuckles, wielding a wooden ruler like a Harry Potter wizard. She taught us we had to be 100% smarter to compete and succeed in life. We moved to Baltimore in 1957 and a medical emergency would set the course of my life. A severe case of tonsillitis and near asphyxia required emergency, emergency surgery. I remember the operating room, the smell of ether and counting backward from 10. Walking the hallway in the pediatric ward, I decided after surgery, I wanted to be a baby doctor and fix all the kids I saw who had cleft palates. We returned to Cleveland at the end of the season. 1959 to 63 Empire Junior High School, the insulation status quo. I either have selective amnesia or dream insulation because our teachers seemed to be just fine at, at Empire Junior High. They were black and white. The wrestling coach, who was also the driver's education instructor, became an important person in my life because he encouraged me to pursue scientific competition through science fairs. He also taught me how to drive a car. I remember traveling mostly by train and buses across country when we traveled with dad. It was dazzling to meet people like Jackie Robinson, Mudcat Grant, Jackie Wilson, and Mahalia Jackson. I loved looking forward to traveling and learning about people. Dream interruption. Please let me wake up. Please let me go back to sleep. 1960-61. I guess dad got traded or something because Larry Doby and his family leased our home in Cleveland, Ohio. I remember all of us piling into the family car and driving over 1,400 miles to Houston. My most romantic memory was meeting Jackie Wilson at a motel we stayed in and getting his autograph. Teens swooning and starry eyes persisted until we traveled further beyond Texarkana and I needed to use the restroom. Dad, I need the restroom. Eyes on the road, 
driving the speed limit, he responded, hold on, baby girl, we'll get there soon. Believe me, we drove past what seemed like hundreds of gas stations with the appropriate facilities. It seemed my eyeballs started floating as I became waterlogged and confused. Then I saw it, a sign as big as day, whites only. What? Imagine a kid with a need to perform a natural function being told that the facilities were restricted and separated for whites and Negroes. Everything I ever thought about how people should treat one another changed in 1960. Many things would come full circle in my professional life 20 years later. Houston, Texas didn't seem like another city in the US to me. It seemed like a foreign country. We were not welcomed. Although my dad played on the same Houston Buffaloes team with the white players, we did not enjoy the same privileges. I got to see home plate preserved where, um, where, where it's preserved at Fingers Furniture on I-45 and Cullen Street when my parents visited here. After a night game once, my mom twisted her ankle tripping down the concrete steps. You see, they always turn the lights out in the Negro section as soon as the players headed for the clubhouse. My first trip to what must have been Jefferson Davis Hospital was that evening to get her medical attention. I only recall how depressed the waiting area was. It was dark and windowless. No white people were there. Our family couldn't stay where white players' families stayed either. We lived on what was called Chocolate Bayou and what I now know was a shotgun house. It was perched on cinder bricks. I had never seen a house with a crawl space beneath it. There was no grass. Rain turned the front yard into mud and a severe rain at the end of summer flooded the yard and mom found a snake in the toilet. Guess what? We left Houston and I promised, quote, I will never come back to this place, a place that hates people like me. Back home in Cleveland, my dad would say to me, remember Linda, don't say what you will never do. God may have plans for you that you cannot imagine. As the dream unfolds, you'll see it was prophetic statement and one of my dad's many wisdoms. In 1961, the term affirmative action was first introduced by President Kennedy as a method to address discrimination that had been persisted in spite of civil rights laws and constitutional guarantees. At age 40, dad retired. He was tired of schlepping his family around the country. There would be no going back to sleep. Awake from the dream in high school, 63 to 67, Glenville Senior High. By now I realized there was something called segregation of neighborhoods and communities. Parma Heights, West Side, and Glenville East Side. I came to suspect it was not accidental. Systemic racism was not the term of the time. Discrimination was. At Burkeye Girls State, I was awakened to my first memorable personal racist attack, not discrimination. Systemic racism masked as discrimination blocked my reaching the Science Fair State Championship. I learned that a key member of the local Science Fair board, a nun, had initiated a change in the rules that the board adopted. My project could not qualify because it, it required sophisticated equipment, a veterinary operating room, and large lab animals at Case Western Reserve. The passion for exploring biological science paid off though. I got to work with a famous hematologist, Dr. Oscar Ratanoff, who actually cited my work in one of his books. A lab assistant in the lab announced to me that I would never be accepted to Oberlin College, which was one of the colleges on my list. With the boldness of a black girl ready to set the world on fire, I applied to Bryn Mawr, Swiss, Swarthmore, Oberlin, Howard and others. When I got the acceptance letter for Oberlin, I returned to the lab 
faster than it took for the stamp to dry. <laughs> the backstory to high school involves the political climate in Cleveland. Carl Stokes, the first black mayor of a major city was elected November 7th, 1967. And I campaigned for him with passion. Because of his uh, election, city hall jobs opened to, to blacks and women. They had been closed before. It, they introduced, it, inter, introduced several urban revitalization programs, one of which was um, recreation departments. And my dad was among those hired. He became director of parks and recreation and facilitated programs in places like Cory United Methodist Church, where I'd learned to swim, play chess, gain exposure to the performing arts through Karamu House, and developed a talent for tennis. My experience in Texas in 1960 was blatantly racist, in the North more subtly cloaked than Jim Crow. In an attempt to quell the bubbling discontent in the 1960s, a group of us from high school were invited by a local TV station to talk about our academics, but they changed the topic the moment the cameras came on to race relations. I was seething because we were sabotaged. Cleveland at the time was a major hub for the civil rights movement. Approximately 50 separate organizations spanning the NAACP to the black Muslims operated there. My community on the east side dealt with schools ultimately that were, weren't fully at, uh, integrated, white flight had happened to the suburbs and there were disappearing economic opportunities. There was also regular police harassment. Awake from the dream, Oberlin College 67 to 71. I chose Oberlin because of its history of inclusion, admitting women, being the legendary last stop of the Underground Railroad before the Canadian border, and Mark Twain's brief residence there. Also, the Gay Men's Scholarship. Oberlin College would open doors to Black activism I could not imagine, but I welcomed. In the spring of 1968, cities across the nation erupted in fire following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. I had selected a white roommate intentionally and she a Black roommate uh, intentionally, but I had to call her mother um, after she referred to Martin Luther King as just another nigger. And I asked her mother, please come and get your child. By sophomore year, I had adopted a Yoruba name, Nana Ashaki, and joined the revolution. I cut off my long hair and had a fro as big as Angela Davis. I was liberated and I was sitting in and protesting. I met people like Julian Bond, Amari Baraka, Max Roach, and Abby Lincoln. We sang or swayed to the music of uh, Gil Scott Heron. Professor Booker Peak and Angela Davis, a visiting campus speaker, became lighthouses for us who wanted to oppose the man. We all knew that the FBI had infiltrated the campus and threatened select campus leaders. By 1971, my class, in protest of the man, refused to wear traditional gowns and we didn't have a yearbook. African-American studies and Afro House were then established and they were places that we could have distinct cultural identity. Awake from the dream, the riots came in 68 in Glenville. And this happened because there was a conflict between the Cleveland police and the national the Black nationalists of New Libya. Once the gunfire died down, three white policemen, three Black nationalists, and one Black civilian lay dead in the streets of Glenville, my community. After the rioting, for three straight days, there was damage to 62 buildings that never really rebuilt. Both, in during, both during and after the riots, Black Glenville residents were brutalized by white policemen 
fueled by racism and resentment from the deaths of their fellow officers. My community, Glenville, would never be the same. I married and divorced in the span of 18 months while at Oberlin. In 1971, I worked in the biology department for two years, then moved to suburban Cleveland, Ohio. Now, during this time, I was smart enough to try to get a job. I had never been in sales, but I interviewed with Wyeth Pharmaceutical Company. I hid my braided afro beneath a Leslie Uggams wig. I sported a pink pastel linen A-line dress and had matching low heel pumps. I sold the interviewer on the advantage Wyeth would have if they hired me, black and female, onto the sales team. I became the first black and the first female representative. I turned down a promotion. I led, the I led my district for, in sales for three years, then turned down a promotion to marketing and relocation to headquarters in Philadelphia. I opted for medical school. When my dad died in 1999, my former district manager, Mr. Panaha, attended the funeral, offered condolences, and congratulated my becoming a physician. My med school applications included, guess what? University of Pittsburgh. As Julie and Bond would say, my eyes were on the prize. My mom thought I had lost my mind, leaving employment with good income and a great future potential. At least I had to try. If I failed, I at least had to try. Unknowingly, I was living dad's dream alive. I was keeping dad's dream alive. Dreaming alive while awake at Ohio State University. Ohio State University College of Medicine, we had approximately 10 to 15 blacks out of 200 um, in our class. That made it possible to have study groups and study pods and foster moral support. Close relationships were forged as we depended on one another to get through the grind. I was five years older than most of my classmates sharply focused and clear about my mission. Medical school graduation would become a major step toward fulfilling dad's dream. Following the celebrations of the hooding ceremony that night, I quietly handed, my degree to my dad as homage to the sacrifice. I'm sorry. My family made for my college years. They had paid for college and I for medical school. It was to honor them and to learn that night that Linda would become the doctor. Completely woke. 1980 to 85, Baylor College of Medicine Internship and Residence. Someone on this call will uh, identify with this. This time, the trip from Ohio to Houston was different. Our U-Haul truck was loaded with mostly donated furniture and our belongings. Sam's sister, my husband, and her friends had packed fried chicken, potato salad, biscuits, and fruit for our journey. Together with my husband's dad and best friend and a, and a school bus yellow Volkswagen Beetle, manual, no AC, uh, we made our trek across multiple state lines and made it into Texas. This time I could choose any restroom I wanted. And I remembered my previous road trip in 1960. Yes, dad, God did have plans. It was 103 degrees the day we arrived, and I thought I'd move to hell. During internship, I rotated at various training hospitals in Houston, the VA, Methodist, and Bedtime. Each rotation revealed assorted microsystemic racist orientations. I listened to the confessions of lightly sedated white male patients in ICUs or operating rooms about their personal involvement and racist attacks against Blacks and or membership in the KKK. One patient was a police officer and another state trooper. 
It was at Methodist Hospital where a colleague and several attendings mistook me for housekeeping while wearing my scrubs without my white coat. Some fellow residents in the eye clinic at Ben Taub referred to patients and or clerks on the wards as monkeys. The volunteers, the Veterans Administration is most memorable. It's memorable for the first time I was called a damn Yankee and I was called a nigger by patients to whom I'd sworn an oath to care for. I advocated for the humanity of a black nurse after my patient paralyzed from the waist down and dying of metastatic stomach cancer had called her a nigger and worse, had placed his feces on his bedside tray, demanding she clean it up. Faster than the road runner in the cartoon, I appeared at his door. Calmly and steeled against his vitriol, I stood at his bedside and asked him what had happened. After he admitted what he'd said and done, I asked him, what am I? I am who she is. If what I am to you is who you said she is, you may have a problem. Never call me or her, anyone else in my race that name again. I didn't care if he reported me to my attending. I left the room, the feces stayed for a while. Fully awake from the dream, I prayed for the future. I prayed to not weaponize my position as a physician against any person who had acted, acted racist toward me or others. Black doctors in the Houston community had embraced many of us newbies. I thought it seemed like the wild, wild west with oil wells pumping along highways and cowboys riding horses along esplanades. But I had black community role models to look to. Internship, hallelujah, was ending. Shortly before beginning residency in ophthalmology, shortly after beginning residency in ophthalmology in 1991, Dr. David Payton, a man of Gentile manners who encouraged me to accept an offer into the departments, resigned. He was pursuing his dream. Another doctor, Dr. Jones, ascended the chair, and although more of a cowboy, tried to be as inclusive and sensitive as he could. As the first and only black resident, I felt like the raisin in the cornflakes. I learned much of the happenings of the department and things that would be going on, not from my colleagues, but from clerks, nurses, housekeepers, or secretaries. My classmates were able to form study pods very easily, but I was often left out. Dr. Jones called me to his office one day, I think to give me a pep talk. Near the end of what he intended to be a pep talk, he said, Linda, I don't see you as uh, a black person. Respectfully, I actually leaned forward and I said, I think I understand your intent to make me feel comfortable, but you and the department have then made me invisible. I bring unique flavors, experiences, and challenges into the mix. I left the meeting, and it was a struggle many times afterward um, to keep quiet about things that secretly terrified me. During residency, several Black residents and assorted programs then, Baylor, University of Texas, formed our own little pods, and we gave one another support as our families grew. I was accepted as fellow in ocular plastics and anterior segment surgery. And supposedly my dream was coming true. Was it? Well, maybe. My answer, yes and not yet. Female, mother of a one-year-old daughter and black. I applied to more than five financial institutions to secure a startup loan for my practice. They all turned me down. A friend then referred me to another institution where I was able to secure a $250,000 loan. 
I started out on my shingle. I've been privileged to serve on medical missions in uh, Burundi, Africa in 1993. I present medical posters at International AIDS Conferences 1998, in Florence, Italy and Berlin in 1993. Over the years, there have been times too numerous to count and too ignorant to recall of incidents of covert and overt racism and or sexism in the surgeon's lounges, doctor's dining rooms, general medical staff meetings, and sometimes from the patient sitting in my exam chair. Whatever was happening or spoken paled in comparison to my focus on patient care. Economics and geopolitics fuel racism. When health insurers moved to the model of managed care, many black doctors were excluded from panels. I sadly attest to black doctor groups trying to get in on the money-making, forming IPAs in the 1990s and early 2000s. One such entity cost me $75,000 in revenue before it filed bankruptcy. That was earned income that I couldn't deduct from taxes and I couldn't get a loan from a bank on my signature. There have been rare minor skirmishes with law enforcement in Houston. When they stopped me, I would, I would be very polite. They'd ask me, was this my car? Yes, use Mercedes. They never stopped me in the Beetle. Use Mercedes. They would ask me, what was my job? Where did I work? And I'd say, Ben Todd. They would let me go because Ben Todd was the hospital where the President of the United States was taken when he was, it was on standby if needed when the President of the United States was here. And at the time, police officers who were wounded were taken to the ER. They might see me there one day. The undercurrent of systemic racism existed in the real estate market. I doubt that my dad's dream included living in a mansion. Yet, following my divorce, my two children and I were blessed to live on the former estate of a Jewish dentist, occupying one and one half acres on the corner of South McGregor and Cullen Boulevard. I would find out that Cullen Boulevard had its most extreme extension and it was called at one point, Chocolate Bayou. Here I was sitting in a house I'd never dreamed of at the very corner of the street on which I'd lived as a kid in 1960. Hindsight is 2020 vision though. I've been privileged to serve our community, one to which I've declared I'd never return. For greater than 35 years, I've been blessed to be a physician to thousands. Corporate CEOs, politicians, pastors, teachers, entertainers, friends, family, blue collar workers, landscapers, entrepreneurs, hospital environmental specialists, and homeless persons. One of my best friends was Carol Saffron. We met at River Oaks Elementary School. She welcomed me into her home where we shared a mutual respect we were vulnerable as women. We had curiosity and love for one another. We became like sisters. She asked me to be there as spiritual support for Dick and her boys as she transitioned to another world. It is that kind of vulnerability, honesty, and acceptance that will make my dad's dream come true. Not professional position or financial class. Yes and not yet. Yes, times have changed. And for the most part, so have white, black, Asian, and Hispanic people's perceptions of black doctors. I'm no longer asked questions about whether I'm an American black or an immigrant who will return home after graduation. Nor am I surprised anymore when a black Houston native would ask, you must be, or would comment, you must be good. I see a lot of white people in the waiting room. Believe it or not, as recently as the summer of 2019, a white patient refused to have the nigger woman doctor 
be the one taking care of him. My colleagues on the front lines of the pandemic of 2020 heard too often, I can't breathe from gasping patients infected with the COVID-19 virus. One might reason that a deadly pandemic and fear of dying alone and isolated tethered to a ventilator or would have fostered more cooperation for the human good. In America, it did not. In Texas, it was more challenging. Houston is a blue city in a red state. Mixed signals on the federal and state levels fostered divisions and white supremacy was given a loud voice. It seemed I have the right to do whatever I want. I joined a rally of black doctor mothers in solidarity against police killings of our black sons and daughters. On our face mask was printed, I can't breathe. The last words heard around the world spoken by a black man as he was, as we collectively witnessed a white police officer kneel on his neck for almost nine minutes. Progress is not a dream come true. It is a movement in what appears to be a positive direction. Many whites and blacks in America would answer yes to the question, am I my father's dream come true? After all, Linda, you're a doctor, you got some money in the bank. But my answer is still yes and not yet. After all, blacks are now hawkers of products and commercials selling everything from deodorant to life insurance. Before the 1950s, major corporate America had not determined our economic buying power. More black doctors in the 50s and 60s appeared in private practice, had control of black owned hospitals and pharmacies, which are no longer in existence. We can tweet and we retweet and post to YouTube. TikTok has taken over the minds of our youth and Facebook really isn't free. And our opinion is no longer ours when we share it with the world. Most blacks don't know BET, once owned by a black power couple, was sold to Viacom in a divorce. Artificial intelligence is proving to be biased racially and autonomous drones are weaponized for warfare. Constitutional amendments, state and local legislation have not reversed ingrained prejudices that blur the vision of some people to truly admit that their ancestors were responsible for what happened to millions of human beings chained in the holes of ships as they were being treated like animals. As recently as June the 2nd, 2021, national news outlets carried this story. Race norming by the NFL a practice that assumed black players started out with lower cognitive function in the $1 billion settlement for brain injury claims in NFL concussion cases. These past years or so have ripped the bandages off the wounds in America and revealed the festering cancers beneath. Healing won't be easy, but healing exposed to clean air which is honest and open awareness, re redacted histories, and the sun or heat lamp of understanding and compassion, a cure can be realized. I'm awake now, and I understand more than my father did, that much of the history of this country, the only home I know and love, has been romanticized and redacted. The prejudices brought into medical schools, fostered in educational institutions at all levels, elected to boards of directors of major health corporations and insurance companies will shape whether we ever reach that dream come true. We will need to address increasing disparities in American medicine as more Im immigrant doctors enter what has become corporate culture model in medicine. I remember saying to my patients about 1986, seven, that they would soon one day not be able to pronounce or spell the names of their doctors. The 1619 project is critical in understanding uh, historical cherry picking, the best parts of any story. We have not had control of our own narrative 
and we have lived someone else's history. Evidence of struggles to control the narrative are as recent as May the 20th, 2021, when the University of North Carolina Board of Trustees refused to give Nicole Hannah-Jones tenure. 10 million survivors and hundreds of millions of slave descendants were subjected to and controlled by whippings, slave laws called slave codes, the use of religion, as well as constant punishment and intimidation. Physical slavery lasted for 250 years and perhaps more. One black person should have been too many to hang from trees or to be mutilated into submission. Physical slavery ended, yet psychological, spiritual, emotional, and economic slavery has persisted in many ways. The veil got lifted completely away during the 2019-2020 um, time as Black Lives Matter, and we know the rest of it, uh, protests began. But history will have to be redacted, and perhaps a dream rekindled because of what we've discovered was covered up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The suppressed and hidden truths about the Tulsa massacre in 1921 are evidences of yes and not yet. Truth told, my father's dream began in Africa, was suppressed for 250 years and repressed for hundreds more beneath the cloud of racism it became a nightmare punctuated with intermittent fits of wokeness. He woke to a new dream of liberties for his children beyond what he started with. Silently and secretly, he continued to dream beyond the boundaries of failed constitutional amendments, civil rights acts, preachers with a dream, politicians the likes of Robert Kennedy, John Lewis and Shirley Chisholm, activists as vocal as Malcolm X and Huey Newton. If you have ever ripped a bandage off a wound, it hurts. I'm waking from my dad's dream and it hurts. Like my brother ripping off the bandage covering a burn on my arm when I was a kid. My dad believed that the hearts of men could be changed. He believed that we were all on the same team and if we work together, we could win this game called living. I can justify yes and not yet. Much of what I cite has been gleaned from the statistics of the National Institutes of Health. We're not there yet. There are too many disparities still in healthcare and a lot of it is institutionalized and ingrained. Dave Pope wanted to be a doctor. His silent hope was that his daughter would achieve that dream. I've never taken for granted the fact that spiritual, cultural, and racial awareness along with exposure is essential to perhaps better understanding between different peoples. Moving and living in different places exposed me to people different than me. When I jumped into the pool, white kids got to learn that the color would not wash off and that my tight curls were soft as lamb's wool. My parents who encouraged their children to be who they are and honor their creator helped me remain focused on the dream, no matter what. I am a doctor, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, that's wonderful. I really appreciate you speaking to us. All right, the floor is open to questions. Uh, Make sure you unmute yourself and uh, who, ha who has a question to start off for Linda? This is Will. Hi, Will. I'd like to speak briefly because I have to leave at 11 to go to another Zoom meeting. But first of all, it was a magnificent speech, not only for your personal history, but the way you wove it into a very un unsparing and honest history of the black experience in North America. And it's a really marvelous thing. You, you and Melba both have stories that are, are history in the making, which is great. Um, 
I wanted to first of all compliment you on doing this because it illustrates not only the huge problems but the opportunities. And I'm very aware of something that happened in Hudson, Ohio on Memorial Day, where a Lieutenant Colonel at a American Legion Memorial Day speech was the keynote speaker. And he's a white guy, looks white, white anyhow. Right. He's white. Wanted to include black history in the memorial thing and was his microphone was muted. <laughs> it sounded like Zoom. It was muted for that part of his speech. And that, of course, was a travesty. But more telling was it has become headline news for all the major networks, and it's getting a lot of publicity it wouldn't have gotten. So the, 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 the dream and the nightmare are still with us. But thank you again, and I hope to listen to it when I've been recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Appreciate that. I wanted to show you something. I've, I've got a lot of my dad's memorabilia. So this is from the old timers game when he played uh, in 1979 at the old timers game in Cleveland. Any more questions? I have a question. Hi, Carolyn. You were talking about how when you were in elementary school, the kids just blended it, you know, it was just natural little kids. Do you have a sense of, was there an age at which that started to feel different or did you go all the way through high school feeling that integration was just natural? Um, I, can, I, I can speak from personal experience in what I think happens when we transition from mid high to senior high. I, I've seen it with my own children here. Um, there just seems to be not the closeness and uh, take uh, kids not seeing um, color um, at that time. So I, I do believe that there's there's something that happens. Um, and my my brother once said it's because you get to the point of dating age, mm -hmm. and that may have something to do with it. That's interesting. Okay. I'd like to make a comment on that. Um, my children, well, two, felt that difference from middle school to high school. Uh, in middle school, my daughter, both of them went to a private school. My older daughter was elected president of her class. And then we received or she received comments from parents how happy they were, but that it wouldn't happen again. And friends told her that their parents told them that they should never again allow a black person to be elected president of their class. Oh my God. Um. Wow. Sad but true, <laughs> sad but true. And, and that's what I faced when I was in competition for science fairs. That wasn't my first science fair in high school. I'd worked all the way through middle high to progress to the point of being able to compete and win the state championship. And that year they changed the rules after the science fair applications were received. I just listened to something uh, a couple of days ago. It was a, a Terry Gross interview on Fresh Air and she interviewed someone named Clint Smith who's just written a book about growing up in New Orleans and he talks about his experience in growing up. And one of the things that he relates was an incident that just startled me and I think woke me up in a way. Uh, the whole thing was just completely mind boggling to me. But in preparing for his book, one of the things that he did was in 2019, he went to a Memorial Day celebration up in Virginia. And it turned out that the celebration was really honoring the Confederate dead, which he, I don't know that he realized that when he went, but when he got there, 
he looked out, this was held in a, in a cemetery in, in Virginia, and he looked out and all of the grave sites were a sea of Confederate flags on the grave sites. And he looked around at the participants in the gathering and they were all dressed in Confederate paraphernalia in oh. costumes dating, dating back to the Confederacy. He was the only black person at this group and he noticed standing in the back of the crowd that people would turn around and take pictures of him, focus their cameras on him. So he felt very conspicuous, but he went around talking to people. And somehow that image of those people dressed in Confederate costumes and celebrating the Confederacy and putting those battle flags all over the grave markers of the, of the Confederate dead in that cemetery just struck me in a way that says, oh my God, we are still in the midst of something very serious here and we have got a long, long way to go. Yes, we do, yeah. You know, in, in Houston, um, House bill has passed. It hasn't, Melba is going to the governor's desk um, and it would be effective in September that you can carry a weapon unlicensed and untrained um, but um, they, have, they are starting to re rewrite voting rules to limit access to voting, and they will not extend Medicaid benefits. And they're also um, not allowing uh, abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. Right. That's right. also under consideration. Right. In Texas. In Texas. Yes. People don't even know they're pregnant at six weeks. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so I think that emphasizes what you said, Linda, several times is it's a, the battle is not over. We still have a long, long way to go. We've made a lot of progress on a lot of fronts, mm -hmm. but there's still a long way to go. Right. We can get there. I do believe we can get there. Well, you know, I lived in Atlanta and um, I, well, actually, I was living there when Kennedy was assassinated. And um, I'm from Connecticut. I was married to a, the social echelons of Buckhead in Atlanta. And um, I was not accepted. They were still fighting the war, and I'm white. You know? I got along fine with the, any anybody black that I knew. I was fine, but when it came to the white girls, forget it. Wow, never would have thought. <laughs> well, we've all had these little experiences, and uh, it's interesting when you start hearing about them from other people, and it mm -hmm. always brings up a lot of personal associations and personal thoughts right. and reflections. Right. And I think it's valuable to do that. I think, I think that's useful. And I think that's what, I hope that's what this group contributes to the whole discussion and dialogue and understanding. And uh, we, we just wanna spread the word and do what we can to affect public opinion and how things are viewed in the larger public. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I would, I, I want to comment um, again, saying, giving thanks to um, Dick for kind of inciting this whole journey. It, it took me a month and a half to write. And um, I had to stop at some points because it, it hurt a little bit. But self-realization is critical to being able to share yourself with anybody else. So everybody on this call I encourage you to write your story, write it down. You'll discover things that make us all so much more in common than ever. We just write your story. If you don't, if I, if, if nothing else happened as a result of this, my children now have my story. This article that I uh, referred to, by the way, I will post a link to that up on our blog post uh, about this session. So if you're interested 
in uh, hearing about this man, Clint Smith, and his book and his reflections on his experiences. Uh, that will be a, a reference that you'll be able to get uh, by coming back to the blog and looking at the blog. Good deal. All right. All right. Anything else? Anybody have any other questions for Linda? Linda, right. thank you for encouraging us to write our stories. I'm perhaps waiting to do that until we start another group at the village, but maybe we can do that. Yeah, you just start. <laughs> <laughs> just start. Thank you so much, Linda. And, and especially because I know it must have been incredibly painful to remember and then to talk about it. And it, it was a real gift. Oh, thank you. It's actually liberating. That's true freedom. I don't know, I, Melba, I don't know you can speak to this, but it's, it's like saying, wow, I'm free. <laughs> you know? um, free to be me. <laughs> I am so deeply touched by your courage and your positive attitude. Well, if I, I don't think we can make it if we're not positive. <laughs> but, you know, if uh, that's half of what's happening as the country is opening, there's so many people who are struggling with depression and they're not positive and they have no hope and they're lashing out at everyone. I'm appalled when I see anyone uh, mistreating someone, but especially black people who sh have struck Asians in this country. There's just no reason, oh. none for that. Um, I have a question and I don't know if you're comfortable answering this, but how do you feel about the fact that a large number of <clears throat> fundamentalist Christians in this country are misusing their religion to cause problems. Well, I, I don't understand how they justify it. Well, every religion, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I've uh, attended seminary and I'm, I'm, I have, I'm a licensed minister. Every religion has done that. That's there are it. zealots and extremists in every religion. Christianity is no different. It has an awful history. Uh, <laughs> you know, well, I'm not one anymore. Right. So, but well, but that doesn't mean it. I'm a I'm a follower. I'm a believer in 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 Jesus Christ. But I I also um, understand the history and what it's done and what what the the purposes have been for it. So anyone can believe whatever they choose. The Bible was redacted to control black people during slavery. There's a black Bible. Slave owners took certain parts out of it because the Bible said, slaves obey your masters. But that's, that's a misappropriation of the intent of something that I believe exists to just help us understand we are created equal and we are valued equally. Now our behaviors, uh, we have to work with that sometimes, <laughs> but um, I, I get it. I've, I've had friends ask me, how in the world are the evangelists, da, 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 and they, I said, because they wanna believe it. You can't force people to believe what they don't wanna believe. It's to their advantage, it's to their advantage. But it doesn't mean that, we, that the rest of us can't speak truth to that power. You understand what I'm saying? I, you know, I was I was amazed when when President Trump held a Bible upside down in front of a church, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> and people were like, "You know, yeah, we just, oh my goodness, we just have a lot of healing to do." Um, yeah, and the I, people who use force to uh, enable him to do that are being uh, prosecuted. They're, they're, they're just, they're whitewashing the whole thing. Well, part of my research doing this paper was to understand that politicians get in place to do things that they don't do. So are we responsible for making sure that they're no longer there? 
and get people there to do what we need them to do. You know, we're sitting, we're sitting here in Houston, Texas with ERCOT that de because of their mismanagement decimated us during a freeze. And I'm asking questions now, okay, what are we doing as a people to hold them responsible? The ERCOT, the ERCOT that Linda refers to is the, is the people that regulate the utilities in Texas, if, if you're not aware of what that is, that, what right. that reference was. Right. So, you know, we, it's, it's the human condition. Linda, I just wanted to add my thanks for your sharing such a beautiful story and, and the way you told it. I just love how you intertwined you know, the facts and the things you see in the newspaper with your personal uh, experiences and your family's experiences. And when you said, like, how great, at least, you know, my family will, will have this to, to read and to know about. I mean, I feel like more people should hear this. Are, do you have any plans to reach out to any, like, the baseball history museums or the, you know, archives at the, at all, at the Negro Leagues and such like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, my, my only, my only focus was to get through this and do this um, uh, because Dick asked me to. And then last night as I was practicing it, and then my, my granddaughter is sitting here. She's my cheerleader. She's my audience. And so um, if it goes beyond this, wonderful. Um, I, I, I would I would not be afraid to do it, but um, I haven't made roads inroads to do that. So we'll see. But thank you. That's a good suggestion. I just haven't thought about it. You know, AARP might be interested. That's true. That's interesting. Well, uh, we did some videos for yeah. AARP for our story. <laughs> They're interested in stories. Somebody do the hookup. But what's, I mean, it's, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll, again, it's all in the Lord's hands in my mind. So I'll do whatever I, I need, what, what I'm asked to do. Especially if it will further um, the greater good. I mean, it's, gee whiz, we have an opportunity to, to turn things around. And if we don't, 2024 might be a bigger surprise than we want. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, it's often been said that those who write the history control the future. And, and uh, the major part, the contribution of the 1619 Project is I think it, it, it's an effort that exposes a lot of the real history of this country and of our society that has been deliberately distorted and hidden. And there's, there's a lot of evidence that shows that very directly. And one of the recent things that has been happening here is the... Uh, centennial of the Tulsa massacre. And that has received a huge amount of, of public attention. And I think that that's something that has now been put on the public record. And I don't think that's gonna be hidden and distorted anymore. And I think there are gonna be more reverberations from that and the 1619 project. And that's what we're trying to do here is participate in that awakening and, and knowledge of our history and spreading of information. So these are some of the positive things that are happening uh, that we can that we can take some hope in. Right. And I feel like that that when things like this are uncovered with the amount of public attention that they're getting, they can't be hidden again in the same way. And and that that's concrete progress forward. It's not right. everything we need, but it's progress forward. Right. And there are other things that are beginning to gain traction. Um, the very fact that the the news cycles are picking up. Uh, the loss of the not being appointed to tenure that's that's been a recurring story that's bubbling up I noticed mostly that when things disappear from the news cycles then they're going to be buried one of those things is um, what's happening with the NFL and the black players and concussions that story appeared only one night and that's because the NFL has power Yes, and, and one of the warning signs to me that we really have problems is all those people who were walking around in Confederate costumes on Memorial Day in 2019, 
it says that, oh boy, those people are not on our side. Right. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? I don't see it. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I guess we'll take the rest of the day and move on to something else. So, Linda, thank you very much. And All right. thank you, Dick. Dick thank, thank you. Thank you, Dick. Dick. Let me say, Linda, just one last thing. I think you broke a leg today, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you very much, take everybody. Care. Take care. Dick, that was deeply moving. Yeah, I thought so too. And I think everybody was a little stunned and just uh, stunned. It's kind of just... disappointed that we didn't get more questions, but uh, that's that's how it felt like that people were just stunned. Yeah, it is. It's just so hard to respond to the the shame, the yes. anguish of this. It's yes. so it's. And I think Linda did a beautiful job. I got to call her and congratulate her and thank it her. It was done beautifully. And it really uh, has pushed forward my thinking about the membership committee's uh, goal of diversity and inclusion. And Dick, what I feel about that is that we have resistance in, in the village to that. Mostly, yeah. I think, because people are not comfortable with relating to people who are different than themselves. And I think one of the goals of the membership committee and, and other groups, and certainly it is your goal in, in the communications and with, with the 1619, is to set up situations where people are having the opportunity to sit by side by side, to work side by side out in the Pasadena community with groups and individuals who are different than white Caucasian. Yes. And that's why I'm so I, interested I, I, in getting a group in to get people inside the village rather than soliciting them from outside. I want them inside the village because I think that's how it can happen. Right. Right. And I think that we're people having the experience of working side by side next to each other on a project somewhere out in the community or whatever will begin to. I, I don't know that we have all that much to offer people of diversity right now. I, I think they, that people of diversity have what we need in the village. I hope I'm saying that in the right way. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, let, me, let me stop the recording here so that we get out of the recording and, and then I, I can talk to you a little bit further. Okay. If you have a few I, I have to leave now because I, I have an appointment that the, the person is waiting, but I'll get back in touch with you. Dave. All right. Yeah. Give me a call. We, we, we can talk a lot. So I look forward to talking to you. Okay. Thank you. All right.